Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Our speaker this afternoon is Ed Weiss. Ed was a 1939 graduate of high school in New York City. He joined the Army at age 17 and a half, lied about his age so he could get in. Now that he's in his 90s, Ed doesn't lie about his age anymore. <laughs> he passed the test for the Signal Corps. He reported to Manila on May 20th, 1940. The Jap he was a Japanese prisoner for 37 months. After the war, Ed was not satisfied living in New York City. His close buddy in a prison camp was from Oil City and asked him to move there. Your buddy in a prison camp is closer than a blood brother. He, he moved to Oil City. He worked as an air traffic controller, mostly in Erie. Ed wrote a book, Under the Rising Sun. Please welcome Ed Weiss. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Uh, sometimes I don't hear myself. Uh, I want to thank you before I begin to all the good people down here who put this program together. I've never seen anything like it. It was so well run and so many good people, so I do thank you. Uh, I'm honored to be the speaker at this program. As we remember all prisoners of war and missing in action of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. I ask you to think back to the role Americans played in these tumultuous events. It was a time when so many of our young men and women were at wars in defense of the country they loved in a time when they missed so many of the opportunities we take for granted today. None suffered more than prisoners of war. This group of special Americans we all honor today and hopefully other days. One can only begin to comprehend what we went through as prisoners of war. In turn for years on end, far from home and loved ones, face to face with their captors 24 hours a day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. And we lost our precious freedom. Today I stand before you not to talk about war, but to pay a grateful tribute to all former prisoners of war and, missing in, and those that are missing in action, and their wives, mothers, and families for whom the effects of war still continue. I also thank them for their loving and devoted efforts to assist us with tolerance and forbearance in our readjustment to a life so vastly different from that which we had experienced. The task was not always an easy one. I and my comrades who had survived the rigors and horrors of those years as a prisoner of war will freely admit that we were often very difficult and at times even doubtful as to our own capacity to cope with the post-war world to which we had returned. For some, in fact, it proved to be impossible. For each of us who did return, our experiences as prisoners of war had been different. Nonetheless, all those experiences were, in war and as prisoners of war, traumatic and with lasting effects on all of us. To explain to anyone who did not go to war or it's not a prisoner of war, our feelings and reactions are incomprehensible. <coughs> 71 years ago, in this month of September, actually September 15th, 71 years ago, 
With the surrender and the signing of the documents in Tokyo Bay, the war between Japan and the United States ended World War II. As you know, the war with Japan began on December 7, 1941, with the tragic Pearl Harbor attack. The Philippines, where I had been stationed since May of 1940, immediately came under attack by the Japanese and was effectively isolated. The Japanese forces surrendered to Bataan on April 9, 1942, and the surrender of the entire Philippines on May 6, 1942. It resulted in the only surrender of a U.S. Army in the field to a foreign country in United States history. And as you know, or may remember, or be aware of, the Bataan Death March took place uh, with the surrender on, in May, in April, excuse me. Uh, while I was an, had an active part in combat with, until the surrender in May, 1942, I was able to evade capture by the Japanese for over four months. In June of 1942, with eight other Americans who had also evaded capture, we located the Philippine sailboat, and though none of us knew much about sailing, we set out to reach Australia, which was 2,000 miles to the south. I say sailboat, not a typical sailboat. This was a freight freighter. It was used to move cargo and freight within the islands, but it had sails, a method of locomotion, so we thought we'd give it a try. Forty-three days we sailed. Not easy, but we did it for 43 days into this attempt. On August 10, 1942, we were intercepted by a Japanese Navy patrol boat and became a prisoner of war. It was the beginning of 37 months, three years, one month, of captivity in the Dutch East Indies on an island named Ambon, 650 miles north of Australia and under the control of the Japanese Navy. If the war had, did not end for prisoners of war incarcerated by the enemy, it became a war of survival and triumph of the American spirit. Being a prisoner of war it is in itself a very harrowing experience with devastating psychological effects. Their captures by the simple fact that you are face to face with your enemy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, month after month, and in my experience, year after year. The Japanese did not observe the Geneva Convention regarding the treatment of prisoners of war. They savagely imposed their own rules and methods of enforcement. We were slaves of the Japanese Empire, forced to perform hard physical labor each day and quite often around the clock, unloading and loading supply ships, moving military supplies, building fortifications, storage and placement of land-based naval guns, stringing barbed wire or beach defenses, and many other dangerous and labor-intensive tasks. The exhausting physical labor and a small amount of poor quality food resulted in malnutrition for all of us. The prospect of dying from physical exhaustion and starvation was very real. Because I and my comrades had escaped from the Philippines instead of surrendering, we were threatened with execution on a daily basis. Medical supplies, treatment of disease or injuries, but none existed. One either survived or died from the effects of injuries and diseases, such as dysentery, cholera, beriberi, pellagra, malaria, 
tropical skin ulcers. You name it, it was there. It was a daily fact of life, if one could call it what we were enduring, life. Some prisoners of war chose not to live any longer, sank into despair, gave up the fight for life, and died. It does happen. I am also aware from my post-war association of men who were incarcerated in the European theater that they too had to withstand forced marches, bitterly cold temperatures, and numerous other related problems. But in general, their treatment was somewhat better than those meted out to those of us who were under Japanese control. The legacy of imprisonment on the health of all surviving POWs is still a major concern today, irrespective of whether they were captives of the Germans, Japanese, North Koreans, North Vietnamese. In my prisoner of war camp, where I, there were 522 Australians, 14 Americans, and seven Dutch, a total of 549. Now this was a smaller camp than a lot of the other camps out there, but that was not to our advantage. Keep that number in mind, 549. When the Royal Australian Navy evacuated us from Ambon on September 10th, 1945, 137 prisoners of war were still alive. Of the Australians, 407 had died, of which 13 were killed by Allied bombings, 17 were executed by the Japanese, and 377 died of overwork, disease, and starvation. All seven of the Dutch survived, of the 14 Americans, five died from overwork, disease, and starvation. So our number, which was 14 Americans, was now reduced to nine. This total does not include the 300 Australians, Dutch, and American servicemen who were executed after becoming prisoners of war following their capture in 1942 during a futile attempt to defend an Allied air base in another part of Ambon Island. Now, to elaborate a little bit on that event, uh, there was an air base on the other side of the island that the Australians had sent approximately 300 men to defend. So, uh, and a handful of Dutch, few Americans, who were there to service the aircraft used in the airport. Uh, when these men surrendered after about 10 days of fighting, uh, the Japanese kept them there, and then they took them out in groups of 20 on a daily basis, or more often, and executed them until they had executed all of the Allied prisoners that were over there defending that airport. In addition to that, another example of Japanese thinking, if you want to call it that, I don't think a lot of times they thought, was in the island of Palawan, where there was over 300 Americans up there building an airfield. And when the Japanese thought that the island was going to be invaded, they herded all the prisoners, all the Americans, in the air raid shelters uh, for, the, for the gasoline into the shelters and set it on fire. So those are just two examples. There's many more examples, but I'm not going to list them. There will not be any any hope, there would not have been any hope for survival for those of us who were still there in, in Ambon had the war not ended when it did. The tragic fact of the prisoner of war in the hands of the Japanese is starkly highlighted by the casualty rate. 
of the 33,587 Americans who became prisoners of war in the Pacific Theater, 12,500 died, died while in captivity. <coughs> but yet many triumphed through forging a special spirit, a spirit of comradeship, caring, support, and a spirit of determination, patriotism, faith in God and country, and a hope for a better tomorrow. Without hope and faith, a man would surely die. It is that spirit that we recognize today. I believe that through the public process of thanking and honoring those who were involved both overseas and at home during World War II, Korea and Vietnam, those who were not involved well, can learn. I am confident that this process will lead to this nation, the United States, being a better and richer place. I stand before you today as a surviving member, prisoner of war, and one who was listed as missing in action for 40 months. The Japanese never reported us as prisoners, so therefore no one knew where we were. We could have just as easily have disappeared. I was one of the more fortunate who returned, and there are at least 1,700, 1,700 American service personnel from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, who are not accounted for. Today, I raise my voice on their behalf. For if we forget, who will remember? Thank you. God bless America. I think we have some time for questions. Of some, some areas I did not touch on deliberately, but I'll try to answer your question if you have any. Yes, sir. Um, what the what the Bethlehem do, do like uh, uh, like the Bethlehem did like people die for our company and try to say our uh, our our clean uh, uh, clean. Uh, I I'm, I'm, I'm having a, my hearing is one of the things that was affected. Okay. Um, with um, people serve our company and try to say that, try to say our. That's what he did. That's what he did. Yeah. 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 And um, uh, and they, uh, people, um, try to uh, try to pipe our choker, try to pipe our choker. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, leak the leak the try to try to keep its cup it safe. They, they try to keep uh, a bite safe. And what 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 is that? You know. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question for me? Okay. Um. Not maybe something that happened there. Okay. What happened there? What 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 happened there? Down there were clippers. Well, what happened there? Down there were a foot of clip in the earth. He wants to know what happened when they were held captive. When we what? When they were held captive. What happened? A whole lot of bad things. A whole lot of bad things. As, as I said, other than the physical abuse, some of the guards seemed to delight in, uh, in abusing it. And uh, when you go on a work party, uh, we would have, of course, sentries, guards, whatever you want to call them. Some of them were okay, they just did their duty. Others were nasty people. And they would beat you because you didn't work fast enough, or they didn't think you were working hard enough, or all that good stuff. Whatever they imagined, we were subject to. Uh, as I said, we had all kinds of tasks. Some of them today, I, I look back at it and I, I wonder how we were able to do it. I don't know whether you've ever, I'm, I'm sure you haven't, but if you've ever imagined, if you could imagine what it would be like to carry a 250-pound sack of rice 
on your shoulders and go down a gangplank as you unloaded some of their supply ships. It was trying. And uh, digging was done, everything was done by manual labor. Uh, I have here somewhere a diagram that might show you. No, that's not it. Uh, everything was done by manual labor. Uh, no such thing as a wheelbarrow or a truck. If they wanted to move uh, cement, for instance, sacks of cement up into the hills, there's no road to the trail, you'd carry them on your, on your back. 50 pound rack, uh, bags of cement up the hill. The same with gravel, sand, whatever. Some of the things they ask us to do today we would consider impossible. But we did it. We did it. It wasn't easy. But you do what you have to do. If you want to survive, you've got to do what you, what you, the best you can. And if you're able... When you if, came back, did the government do anything to help you? I beg your pardon? The government itself, when you came back? Yes. Did they do anything to help you? I mean, it's Yes, they did. They gave me my discharge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was, there was nothing. I spent, we spent about a month in the Philippine area medical testing, fattening up a little bit. Then they sent us back, discharged us. The only thing they offered was reenlistment. No, I wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> so uh, that was it. You went out. Did your thing, you either adapted or you didn't. And that's where the difficult part came in. It's trying to fit back in with society. You know. And there was no, no... There was no counseling. Oh. No. And PTSD was not, had not come into play yet. Mm -hmm. At all, so. You just came back and Went about the daily business that they set up for you until you got discharged. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I had a question regarding toward the end of your uh, term as prisoner, the circumstances of your rescue and whether you were aware or not that the war was coming to okay, an end. Okay, good question. Okay. Yes. I knew we, we received no news at all during that period I was there. We had no radios, no electricity, nothing. I'll get back with you on uh, nothing. So we knew nothing about the war's progress. The only way we, we could measure it is by the activity of our bombing, our Air Corps bombing attacks. First it was the B-24s, then the B-25s, and then gradually got down to the fighters. We knew if they got down to the fighters, they must be fairly reasonably close, but we did not know where. Now. Uh, the atomic bomb we knew nothing about. Uh, one day we lined up to go to work, as we did every morning, and the Japanese interpreter told us that the war was 80% over, that there was an armistice. If the armistice held, we would be free. If the armistice didn't hold, we'd be, go back to work. The next day he said, the war is over. That was on September, around the 10th, 12th, of 1945. So that's how we learned that the war was over. And at that point, had ships come to, how did you actually leave the camp? Were you okay, away that's ships? another area. Uh, we were there, we were still kept inside the camp wire for one month after the war ended. So we were still there in September. I think the war ended in August. Uh, the Japanese, somehow or other, were, were able to contact the Australian authorities who had dominion over that area. And they sent the Japanese, excuse me, the Australian Navy came down and evacuated us on, in September, about the 14th or 15th, about this time, 71 years ago. So 
That's how we got out of the camp. Were the Japanese still there at that time? Oh yes, yes, they were there. Yep. Talking about the Japanese, uh, the Australians had war crimes trials there afterward, and 30, 30 Japanese guards who were involved in all that business were executed, found guilty, executed. The rest of them were given prison sentences anywhere from a year to 10 years and so forth and so on. So it had a lot of after effects on all of us as to what they did there. Uh, the, uh, actually, they, they gave the Japanese the benefit of the doubt, except in the most flagrant cases where they had a witness to a certain happening, <coughs> beheadings, beatings, executions, stuff like that. And talk about American bombing, the, the, our bombers took a great interest in that place because that was the headquarters for the Japanese Navy in the southern part of that area. And uh, they bombed two or three times a week. Now, I want to tell you something. When you're down there and they're up there, they can't tell whether you're Japanese or Americans. So there were many, many, many times the Japanese guard and me shared the same fox roll in the bombing. So, I mean, it's all fair game. The camp was hit twice. Even though it was quite prominent, it had been there before. The camp was not built after the Australians surrendered. It had been their, their camp, encampment, when they were sent up in December to help defend the island. So it was a ready built uh, struck, uh, camp. The only, only thing the Japanese had to do is put barbed wire around it. So anyhow, the camp itself was bombed twice. The first time, uh, it was felt that it was friendly fire. Uh, there's nothing friendly about it, I'll tell you. But anyway, they, they bombed the camp the first time. Meanwhile, the Japanese, there's a whole lot of stories here. Meanwhile, the Japanese had stored about 200,000 pounds, 400, 400, 500 pound aerial bombs in one of the sheds in the camp perimeter. Well, either accidentally or intentional, one of our planes set that shed on fire by bombing and it blew up and it destroyed most of the camp. It killed about 25 Australians and I 30 or more Dutch civilians who were in another camp across the road and injured a whole bunch of people. So we had to rebuild the camp again. And uh, that was, we got away with that for a while. The camp was not marked in any way. And then in 1945, they did another number on the camp. Now that time we had the air raid shelters done so we were able to escape the effects of the bombing. Only one person was killed and that destroyed the camp again. So we had to rebuild the huts again. Uh, that's what the camp looked like right there. That, that bottom picture is actual photograph of the camp in 1945 when the war ended. The, those are huts. And my residence, my suite, and the Trump Tower is right there. <laughs> so uh, that's how, how it went. And uh, there was one threat. If you weren't under threat from the Japanese, you always had to be aware of the threat from our bombing. Any other questions? Group of men there? That's the ones who survived. Is Clyde Rurick in that picture? Yes, she is. Which one is it? Second row, right hand side. 
He was your friend from Oil City? Yeah. Second row, and to the right. Okay. Yeah, I know. Right. Right there. Yeah. Okay. Don't fall. Right there. Okay. Okay. Got it? Yep, I remember. Okay. So, that's my story. Or yeah, part of it, anyhow. When you were walking down the street after you got out and you ran face to face with the Japanese, were you bitter? Did bitter. You, did you want well, to harm them? Uh, let, me, let me say this. It's been 70 years. When I first got out, I was angry. Sorry, Very man. angry. Not because they were Japanese, but because the way they treated us. Sure. And, the, and the, the, there was no need to do that. We weren't going to win the war or lose the war for them. We'd done our thing and that was it. But I was very angry. Uh, since that time, I've had very little thought about that. I did think for a while that I would like some sort of revenge. But to, to, to actually have revenge, you have to feed yourself, that thought. As soon as we were out, back with our own people, that thought went out of my mind. Punished, yes, but anything beyond that, no. So today for the Japanese people, Japanese people of today are not the same as the Japanese of those days. And I have a lot of respect for what they did since the end of the war. So I think that that probably is as good as I can put it. I did correspond with uh, the Japanese interpreter's family, his wife, his daughter, medical officer for the Japanese Navy. I, I carried on a lot of correspondence after the war, years after the war, because it took me a while to find all these avenues to use. And I was able to talk or correspond with some of these people. And they told me their side of it. And as I sat there and read their letters, I had to have a, I had a little feeling for, a little empathy for what they were going through with the bombings and the atomic bomb and all that stuff. We knew nothing about the atomic bomb. Yeah. And I want to tell you this, don't ask me if it was a good thing or not, because I'm here because of that. Had it not been for that, I would not be here. Now that may be selfish to you, but that's survival. Okay, and all the other prisoners of war, and civilians, and they had many of them, would not be here today, because the order was, in the event of an invasion of Japan, all prisoners were to be executed. So that's how close it came. So as far as my feeling to the Japanese are concerned, today, I'll accept them. I won't go out of my way. But if they happen to be there, that's okay. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, excuse me, I owe you one. Um, when you were captured, was there any chance by any time you were there, was there any other prisoners escaping at all? Yes, I really brought well, that up. Every day we thought about that. Eh, escape, the question is. Every day we thought about it, especially since we've been so successful until we got caught this time. Getting outside the wire was not a big problem. The problem was being white in a strange area where the, we had no idea uh, who was friend or foe among the native population. We knew that many of them were uh, on the Japanese side. The Japanese offered rewards if they turned in an escapee. Uh, the question was, where would you go? If you look at that map, I'll show you here. If you look at that map, 
You've got all this water here. Now, how do you get from here to wherever our people are, which were somewhere out in here? That's a lot of water. And you, if you couldn't get help from the local people to get food, shelter, some type of a boat or something, there was no place to go. It was impossible. Getting out of the camp, no. Getting off the island, going somewhere, yes. It remained that way. Okay. Um, did you guys ever think at one point, like, how we take one of their boats? Did we do what, huh? Take one of their, like, small boats, maybe? Small. Take one of the small boats. Steal one of the Japanese boats to escape. Small boats. Small boat. Oh, you'd be surprised what we thought of. <laughs> Believe, me. Believe me, we won the war. Yeah, we, we did, we did. It was all, we fantasized. Why don't we try this, why don't we try that? Uh, you still could not go anywhere. Where, where were we gonna go? We even fantasized about stealing one of their airplanes from a nearby air base they had. All this is fantasy. You do it when you're desperate. But none of it proved to be workable. None of it. So, but escape was, was always in our mind. We all had a plan. If the island was invaded, what we would do. So, you're Japanese. Because they had, Japanese had this 10 for one. For every prisoner that escaped, they would execute 10 in the camp. Now that's a pretty severe deterrent, especially in the American case where there was only 14 of us. If one of us had escaped, they would have wiped out the rest of them. And you didn't want to have that on your conscience, knowing that you were defeated before you ever started. So that was deterrent. But escape was always thinking, always thinking about escape. Weird thoughts. We had all kinds of weird plans, none of them workable. So I think we'd reached the end of the line in that area. And I think that just about covers most of what I have, what I have although I'll be glad to answer any questions. Yes, sir? What did the guards do with the bodies that the Prisoners that uh, expired or were executed. What, what did they do? What did they do with the bodies? Or I was a funeral director. I dug the holes. I helped dig the holes. They had a camp cemetery, and the rule went out, or the order went out, that since the Americans were responsible for the war, we were responsible for the deaths of the prisoners which of course, you know, is hogwash. But I was on the burial detail and dug many a grave and buried many a man. How many of those do you think were ever, those remains were ever returned okay. to their That's a good point. I, I have the time, so I'll tell you. On, on the site where the camp was, where the camp was, the Indonesian government donated oh, about 15 acres of that area, and the Australian War Memorial people established a cemetery, much like our Arlington is. And they brought in all the Allied dead and the prisoners of war who died at the camp, brought them back down the hill from the cemetery where we had buried them and reburied them in this new cemetery. It's a very impressive cemetery, believe me. I was back there and uh, uh, it, was, it was impressive. So that's what happened to them, those that they recovered. Now there's some that have not yet been identified. They're still identifying people they don't know who, Australian, Dutch, British, American, what? 
but they're still working on it. Are you the only survivor Ed, of the group that came off? Of As of right now, I am, yes. What time is it? Oh, okay. I wondered if you'd like to speak about uh, what you could find to eat while you were there. While we were there, not very much. And in the beginning, the Japanese let the Australians use the supplies they had there. And they supplemented that with rice. And that went on for about, well, until the, camp, until, the, until the camp was bombed and everything was flattened. And they lost all of that. Then we became entirely dependent upon the Japanese for food, for supplies. Uh, in the beginning, the Japanese were generous with their rice supply. You got a pound of rice a day cooked up, that made a pretty good deal. But as time went on, it went down, 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 down. By the end of the war, in 1945, we were getting about an ounce and a half of rice per day. Now, if you put that in a, in a pot, you might see something floating around in there. But you certainly couldn't get a hold of anything. So we were down to an ounce and a half of rice. And everything that was brought in, either uh, surreptitiously, which there was some, a little bit of that, or what the Japanese supplied, went into one big pot. And we lived on soup. So I, to this very day, I like soup. But everything went into the pot. No matter or not what it, what it was, a few sweet potatoes, a cucumber, a pumpkin, uh, little bits of uh, sweet potato vines, and things of that. Nothing really substantial. In the beginning, they did bring in and give us things like a shark, very good eating, cooked properly, a shark or tuna. A lot of tuna out there. But as time went on, they couldn't go out and do this because of the Allied activity that prevented them. And in effect, they had them isolated. So the food went downhill. And in the end, we were not, oh, we were getting uh, cassava, which is a, a root potato, somehow, something like a potato, only it grew in, it, like in the form of a carrot. And uh, there wasn't much else. Sago, which is like wallpaper paste, you know. It wasn't very helpful, but you ate it. You had nothing else, you had no choice. So, that's about it. Yes, sir? Did you cook your own food? Uh, at, in the beginning, yes. No, we had a camp cook kitchen. But all the guys would scrounge stuff, and cook it. But then the Japanese said, no, you can't do that. But after a while, they did it anyhow. If you were fortunate enough to have something to cook, you could cook it. But most of the time, you didn't have anything to cook. So you relied upon what you got out of the camp kitchen. Yes, sir. We've got a few minutes yet. Oh, hello. I didn't see you back there. How did it feel to be free? Did you like run and do cartwheels and count the clouds? Could you tell me what you said? How did it feel to be free? Well, I'll tell you. How did it feel to be free? It took a little while to realize you were really free. It took a while. It wasn't like you threw your hands up in the air and said, I'm free. It was, it was sort of a, I don't know, I can't describe it. Uh, sort of a period of time when you, when you, couldn't, you couldn't accept, or your brain or your body didn't accept the fact that you were free. It wasn't until I got back to uh, Mortai, which was about a week or two after release from the camp, I finally realized I was free. So it's, it's a difference. 
it, 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 it made a difference in how you felt, yes. But how exactly, I can't explain it. But it was not like you saw those pictures in Times Square, that sailor kissing that gal. It wasn't like that. Very quiet, very laid back. So the, the, the point was, from the time that the war ended to the time we were evacuated from the island, we were never really free. We were still under guard, confined to the camp, and so forth. It was only until we got out of there and changed your mental attitude. Three years is a long time to have to endure some of that. And it doesn't something that goes away the next day. So that's about that. We're almost there. Last question? <laughs> yes, sir. Is there anything that you could share uh, as a reflection of your experience that you carried with you uh, uh, beyond that time? Any lessons or things that you carry with you to this day as effective that were affected by that experience? Uh, run that by me again. Is there any lesson that you learned during your experience as a prisoner of war that you carried with you beyond? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I learned a lot. I'm still learning. Okay. Uh, when I first came back, and that's one reason I, I, uh, I didn't stay in New York City or that area where my father was. Uh, I couldn't stand it, the people. I couldn't stand the crowds. I didn't like crowds. I liked out in the open. And that's what I found so great back here in this area. The green, the hills, the trees, the people, so forth and so on, all the good difference. Uh, so I would say that, yes, and I began to get to the point where I began analyzing people. You'd come up to me and be friendly, that's okay, but I wouldn't accept you. I'd have to think about it. And I, I coined a phrase, you've probably heard it before, and I'm sorry to say so, but I had the phrase, phrase people are no damn good. So, which I was wrong. People are good. It's just the right people versus the wrong people. So, that's one of the things I learned. Patience. Patience. I always learned there's always tomorrow. Yesterday, I knew what was yesterday. Today, I know what today is. Is there any hope for tomorrow? And hopefully, there will be. And hope, hope, hope. That's what we wanted the most. Hope. Hope for tomorrow. Day to day. So, I guess that's about all I have to say unless somebody wants to ask something. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do want to. I do want to thank the center here and all the good people who put this together. It's amazing. It's amazing, really. And they all deserve all the credit that we can give them. And I wish them success in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was super. Thank you.